West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com history, it's not always correct, especially when the government lies to you. Which brings us now tonight to a pivotal period in our recent era, the conclusion of that highly anticipated Mueller probe. You follow the news, you're watching the news right now, so you may remember that whole period. Different Trump figures went down. They were searched, indicted, convicted. And then Mueller turned in his detailed report to the DOJ, but it did not immediately go out to the public. Many expected the report to put some heat on the administration and pressure then Attorney General Barr to release it rather than simply hide it. But he had a different trick up his sleeve, a middle ground that actually matters in the news tonight, and I'll explain why. Barr infamously scooped the entire Mueller report with his own misleading summary. It was so clearly off the mark that Mueller took the rare step of writing Barr, nominally his supervisor, to call out the deceit about the true nature and context of the entire report that he spent so long creating and investigating and writing. Now that was then. This is now. Long time since then, especially the way the news has been lately, but Barr hasn't faced much serious questioning about what he did. That's partly because, like many people in and around government, he tries to stick to friendly environments when he wants to get his message out, Fox News appearances, and of course the occasional legally required deposition, like when he went in and testified to the January 6th committee and under oath suddenly started talking about why Trump was a liar and lied about the election. But here's what's different right now if you haven't seen it yet. Barr just went on real time with Bill Maher on HBO and took some questions and tried to spin his spin on the Mueller report, claiming that that whole unusual PR stunt with his cover letter was somehow, and this is false, he claimed the only choice he had. And then he blamed Mueller for how the report came in. I said, you have to give me a report that I can make public quickly. It has to be redacted. Because the day you give me the report, everyone's going to be speculating. You have to give it this way, or or, or people will speculate, OMG. Two problems there. One, Mueller's team did prepare a version for public release. And even if the DOJ wanted to take any time for an extra review, that, of course, is the version that essentially came out later. There were some redactions and some fights over it, but 90 plus percent of it was what they gave him. And second, Barr is claiming that public speculation is the reason that he, the powerful attorney general, had to rush out his take. Now, that is false. The DOJ stays quiet or waits on many different topics or cases while the public in a free society speculates and the press sometimes speculates. And that does not create any obligation for anyone in government to do anything, nor should it. Public speculation is not a legal or logical reason 
for Barr to rush anything. And boy, did he rush. He rushed it right out this weekend. Now, maybe one, let me give you one example. There is plenty of speculation about how Jeffrey Epstein died in a federal prison. Who was in charge? Bill Barr. That was on Bill Barr's watch. And you don't see Mr. Barr, while in government or out of government, rushing out a ton of information, transparency, or claims about that mysterious and controversial death just because of, quote, speculation. We call bull, Mr. Barr. Now, in this new interview, Mr. Marr pushes back and Mr. Barr continues with his spin and defends how he issued his own purported legal conclusions that had very real consequences and really scooped the Mueller report. I read he did give you that. No, he did not. Okay. So when he came in, and by the way, there was no pressure for him to give it on any day certain. He could have taken his time and redacted it. He came in and they gave us on Friday the report unredacted. It was illegal to put it out. I felt that I had to say something to give the bottom line of, of what he decided. Number one, I said he found there was no collusion. It's like going out and announcing a verdict. I didn't regale the whole trial, but I said, there, he said there was no collusion. Well, you and, framed and, it as he was innocent, and then everything else had no, I didn't. to be argued against that. And well, then he if, said we can't come to the conclusion that he didn't obstruct justice, and you said he didn't obstruct justice. You know, Barr is being tricky there, and this is important for the record in the world. Barr knows any call about presidential lawbreaking in this type of probe goes to Congress. It doesn't go to the president's own appointed AG. That's why Ken Starr sent his famous findings to Congress. And then, as we know from all of the recent impeachments, Congress can decide whether or not to impeach. Indeed, it's worth remembering that Democratic Congress declined to impeach on the evidence in the Mueller report. And then, of course, Trump did other things that led to his historic two impeachments. Now, Mueller was working along the same lines as Starr. Evidence of presidential lawbreaking going to Congress and there was a contrast here in what he said and what Barr tried to spin. Now, Barr's misleading approach is also about more than those legal nuances. And I want to get this down for the record tonight, too, because it matters. Mr. Barr used his power to mislead and to muddy the waters. Now, there's no evidence that he broke any laws. We're not talking about some crime. We are talking about an abuse of the authority that he had in a very lawyerly and devious way. Indeed, in those very few first few hours when this Barr letter dropped, Mr. Barr got headline writers and even some TV networks to wrongly treat the Barr summary as if it captured the Mueller report itself. To pick one headline, and Politico is not alone, but I just want to show you how this works so you don't get tricked the next time, and so Mr. Barr might not get away with it or people like him. Politico's headline said, Mueller finds no Trump-Russia conspiracy. They made the mistake of taking the Barr summary and treating it as the Mueller report, which it was not. So when you see how this trick works, you might actually be a part of the fact-based community that makes it harder for the government to lie to us next time. And I will tell you how we dealt with this. I remember rushing to the newsroom when that Barr summary dropped. I remember already seeing those fast reactions online on Twitter and some of those headlines I just mentioned that seem to really potentially misunderstand, which is different, right, than joining the deceit. Sometimes people just get tricked, especially in this town where everyone's rushing out to have a smart and fast take. And in our breaking news that day, I can tell you, we got on the air and reported how the material, whatever it said, was bar material. It was only the bar letter. It was not the entire Mueller report. Not the Mueller report everyone's been waiting for. This is four pages. There's not a single full sentence in here that's quoted the Mueller report. The most important parts of this letter are the direct quotes from the Mueller report. Everything else is Barr's views. I would note four sentences uh, that are in the letter that are attributed to the Mueller report. Not a single one of them is a complete sentence. No complete sentences. That was suspicious. If you ever want to get inside the mind of the reporters, and we all work together, we have a big team here, we work hard together. Sometimes we have these conversations and say, well, can we say that it's a lie? Not responsibly, because I didn't have the underlying Mueller report. I could just try to tell you that Mr. Barr had his own troubled record, and if there were full sentences in the report that Mr. Barr thought were so true or helpful to, obviously, the person he thought of wrongly as his client, Donald Trump, he might have done a whole sentence. So, do I repeat myself? 
Yes, occupational hazard. But this matters. There's a great saying on the internet, don't feed the trolls. The trolls are the people who just want to upset you or lie or comment on a picture to get you upset. You don't feed them, you don't respond to them. We need that right now. We also need a new saying or a related one. Don't reward the liars. This was a very clear case study and how somebody powerful with selective access to information could spin a whole town and there were consequences. But it need not happen again. It is Thursday, the 26th of January of 2023. And you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef to cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. A little bit of jambalaya. A little bit of spice in your life. Oh my. Well, well, well. How are you today? Uh, I just needed to have a little bit of Ari uh, uh, give a breakdown on old Bill Barr there. It's, it's everything that we all know about already, but it's good to be reminded. And uh, there are some out there who probably they think this is the first time they've heard it, but it isn't. It's probably the fourth or fifth time, but they just can't remember. Yeah, that uh, affliction of memory has been affecting the American public for quite some time, before you and I were born, even. All right. Okay, well, no institutional memory. You can get away with anything you want, right? Right? That's how, that's how they're trying to make Florida. Jeez. <laughs> okay. Well, we know what that guy's all up up to and all about. Well, we have uh, we're still getting a little used to the new configuration here at the desk. The uh, microphones in a different spot, and uh, we have an array in which we uh, we handle this powerhouse of resistance called Netroots Radio. It is the mothership, after all. And guess guess who's the chef de cuisine for that? You got it. Anyway, uh, the crew is out being busy today, and uh, hey, everybody's got to pay the bills. Yeah, they do. We all do. And we do what we can. And uh, who knows? Maybe we'll be spending $30 uh, for every hundred. 30% sales tax. That's right. Now, I got to tell you, that might be a, uh, shall we say, a deal killer with the gun nuts. Do they really want to spend 30% on every bullet they buy? I don't think so. I do not think so. It adds up. And some of those guns are not really that uh, inexpensive. You know, in relative terms, maybe they are. You know, I mean, it's <laughs> they still cost more than a dozen eggs. So let's just put it that way. That's how expensive they are. Anyway, uh, do they really want to spend $30 on every hundred? <laughs> to buy a gun? Well, on the other hand, maybe that'll drive a lot of underground sales. Uh, apparently, uh, the restrictions that have been put on uh, the underground sales of guns have it impacted their bottom line. And they're looking for a way to get back in the red. Or is that the black? Well, they're already in the red, so they got to get out of the red. Ah, it's not Monday morning, it's Thursday, but it's still the morning. And we need more caffeine. One more cup. And we'll get it, too. So, um, Trump got put back on, um, they're calling it Meta, it's Facebook, right? Just so we remember what it's all about, change their names. Who do they think they are, Eric Prince? Anyway, uh, Trump has been allowed back on. And the first thing Trump did was, like, trash Facebook. Well, <laughs> good. Trash them both. It's like watching two big old dinosaurs duking it out there in the, I don't know, savannah. 
Must have been in the prehistoric savanna. All of his little rat mammals and stuff watching these giant dinosaurs, Stegosaurus, and uh, I don't know, give him a T-Rex. They're duking it out. Stegosaurus trying to hit him with his big old tail. With the mace at the end of it. I always like that. So, um, and and maybe either one, you'd like to see, you know, maybe both of them fall over. And a lot of times they did. So we little rat mammals could scurry away. And survive to take over the world. And we did. Okay, well, uh, so much for those metaphysics. Is that metaphysics? All righty. What else? Uh, oh, Pompeo. I can't go on without mentioning what a little schmuck that guy is. And apparently a lot of people think that he's, like, really intelligent. Oh, yeah, top of his class. You know, he was, like, at Harvard, and he was at the, some military academy. West Point, West Point. Pudgy guy. Yeah, I don't think he was out in the field. I know he's lost a lot of weight now, but still. <sighs> think about his grifting wife and both. Well, he and his grifting wife together. Okay. And he thinks that he has the wherewithal to exact moral turpitude upon the rest of us. And sometimes the rest of us might be a Jamal Khashoggi. Oh, he was no real journalist. He was an activist. Oh, so you're going to go ahead and dismember activists then. Jeez. So much for a free society. Anyway, what was it that Jamal Khashoggi was uh, exposing? Oh, what was it now? Big C word? Yeah, corruption. If there's one thing that Pompeo doesn't want to talk about, it's corruption. Because he and his wife are really corrupt. You can't actually be a maggot. I know I'm not supposed to say maggot. Let me back up a little bit. You really can't expect a MAGA Republican to be a MAGA Republican without being corrupt. It's a job requirement. <sighs> okay. And now they are running the show and they're going to exact revenge. It's not about rooting out the failures and how to right them. It's to exact retribution, just like a little banana republic knee-jerk goose-stepping you-know-what. Gosh, I feel like I'm on a roll today. Put a pulpit in front of me and see how it changes right into Latin. Maybe a little bit, bit of Greek. Maybe not. Okay, well, oh, I have to turn around. See, there's a little bit of a different configuration, and I have to figure out a, a efficient way to look at the clocks. Where I'd like to have the clock with seconds on it is on the new Mac, but I, I guess I have to buy an app or something for that. I'm going to have to look into it. So much to know. And so little time? Yeah, apparently, boy. We won't get into that, at least not today. So instead, why don't we step away from this virtual pulpit in which I, I've been sermonizing, ranting, whatever you call it, and give you a rundown on what else we have in store for you here in this salon we call West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Well, as we begin here in the Bistro Cafe, or carry on, because we've already begun, technically, on the rest of the menu here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, New York's Attorney General warned the owner of the Madison Square Garden that it may be violating anti-bias laws with its practice of barring lawyers from its venues and using facial recogni recognition technology to do so and enforce it, too. A record 16.3 million people have sought health coverage through Obamacare this year. 
And the Department of Agriculture announced it is reinstating restrictions on road building and logging on the country's largest national forest in southeast Alaska. We know it as the Tongass. After the break, we move to the chef's table where Spain issued an app-based food delivery company a new fine of $62 million U.S. for violating labor laws. And the results of a survey in the Netherlands showed a, quote, disturbing lack of awareness of key historical facts about the Holocaust, end quote. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. At netrootsradio.com. To the right of the page is the chat room link. And the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. To the left uh, across the page uh, from that chat room link at our homepage at netrootsradio.com is the link to our Patreon site. And if you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, I cannot tell you. And I can also say in the royal we, we cannot tell you how important it is that you do become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio because your recurring Patreonage helps us uh, put a big dent in the bills that we pay. And there's quite a bit, actually, to run this little powerhouse of resistance on a shoestring. And we thank you for keeping that shoestring. Well, you know, as a shoestring. Thank you. It's, it, we're, we're doing it. And and it's because of you. So thank you. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, you can do so at Netroots Radio. You can also find us on Mastodon at uh, Netroots Radio at MSTDN or is it dot? One of those two. But MSTDN, Mastodon, plus dot plus. So find us on Netroots Radio there and uh uh, Tom takes care of all that part of the social media. Thank you, Tom. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I incidentally post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's 10 minutes before showtime. And then uh, that gets linked up on social media platforms that you can then find on wherever you are and uh, link up to those actual articles as they were actually written. And that's why they're there. You can also follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West. I suppose I should make Mastodon accounts for myself and the show. Maybe post. Maybe Spoutable. I'm looking at Spoutable, too. Anyway, uh, follow the show on Twitter for now at Cookbook West. And please do pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, etc., 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 etc. All right. I've said before that I, you know, if somebody started a social media company called etc., you know, with the ampersand, you'd make a lot of money. I just think so. Okay. Enough of that speculation. Let us now get into this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. Oh, I might add the recipe, my recipe for Metro Shrimp and Grits can be found at the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's. And you can find that, uh, you know, when I put stuff up on, on Twitter and other social media platforms. Anyway... 
Karen Matthews of the Associated Press brings us this first offering. New York's Attorney General warned the owner of Madison Square Garden and Radio City Music Hall that it may be violating anti-bias laws with its practice of barring lawyers from its venues if they work for firms suing the company. The Attorney General's office said in a letter to MSG Entertainment that the ban and the company's use of facial recognition technology to enforce it may violate anti-discrimination laws and may dissuade lawyers from taking on cases such as sexual harassment or job discrimination claims against the company. MSG Entertainment cannot fight their legal battles in their own arenas, Attorney General Letitia James said in a statement, Madison Square Garden and Radio City Music Hall are world-renowned venues and should treat all patrons who purchase tickets with fairness and respect, she added. The lawyer ban came to light in October of 2022 when attorney Larry Hutcher, a longtime New York Knicks season ticket holder, was told that his seats had been revoked because his law firm was representing ticket resellers suing MSG. He filed a lawsuit in response. Well, what do you expect? Since then, other lawyers have come forward with story, stories of being blocked from concerts, sporting events, and shows, including the Rockettes' Christmas Spectacular. That is a crime that just cannot be rectified. How dare Madison Square Garden. The policy potentially affects thousands of lawyers at scores of firms and is being enforced through the use of technology that scans the faces of people entering venues owned by Madison Square Garden and checks them against a data bank of lawyers from banned firms. The Attorney General's office said research has shown that racial, fa uh, facial, <laughs> yeah, racial, you'll see, Facial recognition software may be plagued with biases and false positives against people of color and women. The Attorney General is asking Madison Square Garden to respond by February 13th because everybody's going to do something else on Valentine's Day, so it's got to come the day before. And identify efforts the company is making to ensure compliance with applicable anti-discrimination laws. In a statement, a representative for Madison Square Garden said the policy does not unlawfully prohibit anyone from entering our venues, and it is not our intent to dissuade attorneys from representing plaintiffs in litigation against us. We are merely excluding a small percentage of lawyers only during active litigation. The statement continued. Our policy is never applied to attorneys representing plaintiffs who allege sexual harassment or employment discrimination. Madison Square Garden representatives have previously said it wasn't unreasonable that MSG would want to protect against improper disclosure and discovery during active litigation. New York state lawmakers introduced a bill earlier this week that would prohibit sports venues, including Madison Square Garden, from refusing entry to perceived enemies of their owners. An MSG spokesperson said the bill's sponsors were siding with attorneys representing ticket scalpers and other money grabbers. Well, Madison Square Garden ought to know. of the Associated Press 
brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A record 16.3 million people sought health insurance through the Affordable Care Act this year, double the number covered when the marketplaces first launched nearly a decade ago. More than 3 million new members joined the marketplace, also known as Obamacare, according to the Department of Health and Human Services. The government worked with nonprofit groups and invested in program specialists who helped to sign people up in low income immigrant, black, and Latino communities to enroll more people, said Chiquita Brooks Lasur, administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. We made unprecedented investments to expand our enrollment organization footprint into nearly every county in the country and targeted the hardest-to-reach communities, she said. The boost in enrollment comes as the number of uninsured people is at its all-time low. Just 8% of those in the United States remain without coverage. And that must be a terrible thing for those repugs to hear, in this reporter's opinion. President Joe Biden and a Democratic-led Congress have committed millions of dollars over the past two years into unlocking low-cost insurance plans for more people and prohibited states from kicking people off Medicaid during the COVID-19 pandemic. The marketplace itself has also evolved in recent years, with more insurers joining, giving an overwhelming majority of Americans at least three plans to consider during enrollment. Those breaks on coverages were extended through 2025 under a major climate and health care bill championed by the Democrats last year. The low-cost plans, which offer $0 premiums for some entering the marketplace, have reversed what was a flat market for the Obama-era health law, said Macy Worley, a principal at health consulting firm Avalier. To have this level of continued increase is really interesting, Worley said. We were in a position several years ago where overall exchange enrollment was flat. Oh, you mean during Trump years? And it was declining. So many people thought the exchanges were this stable, but was a dwindling environment. The significant progress on lowering the uninsured rate across the country, however, is threatened this year. Millions of people expected to lose their Medicaid coverage starting this spring when states will begin the process of removing removing people who are no longer eligible in many cases because their income is now too high to qualify. A portion of those people are expected to transition from Medicaid to the marketplace and the administration said it is spending $12 million to keep information specialists on the job in the coming months to help people enroll in the health laws marketplace if they lose Medicaid coverage. Some who have had Medicaid coverage over the past few years will decide they can spare a few dollars every month to keep coverage through the health laws marketplace, Worley said while others might decide they cannot afford coverage that often has higher co-payments, deductibles, and monthly premiums than Medicaid. They will have to make real choices, Worley said. If you're already struggling to make rent and pay your utilities, put gas in your car, put food on the table, you may just not be in a position.
Associated Press brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. A federal agency said yesterday, Wednesday, it is reinstating restrictions on road building and logging on the country's largest national forest in southeast Alaska. The latest move in a long-running fight over the Tongass National Forest. The U.S. Department of Agriculture in late 2021 announced that it was beginning the process of repealing a Trump administration-era decision that exempted the Tongass, a rainforest that is also home to rugged coastal islands and glaciers, from the so-called roadless rule. The agency yesterday said it had finalized that plan. The new rule will take effect once it is published in the Federal Register, which is expected to happen tomorrow, Friday. The Tongass is roughly the size of West Virginia and provides habitat for wildlife, including bears, wolves, bald eagles, and salmon. Oh, my. Roadless areas account for about one-third of all U.S. national forest system lands, but Alaska political leaders have long sought an exemption to the roadless rule for the Tongass, seeing the restrictions as burdensome and limiting economic opportunities. They supported efforts under former President Donald Trump to remove the roadless designation for about 9.4 million acres on the Tongass. Republican Governor Mike Dunleavy on social media said people in Alaska, quote, deserve access to the resources that the Tongass provides, jobs, renewable energy resources, and tourism, not a government plan that treats human beings within a working forest like an invasive species. Well, that's what the Earth thinks we are. Now, the dispute goes back more than two decades. The U.S. Department of Agriculture, in revisiting the issue, cited a directive from President Joe Biden at the start of his term to review and address rules enacted under Trump that might conflict with environmental and climate aims laid out by Biden. U.S. Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack, in a statement called the Tongass key to conserving biodiversity and addressing the climate crisis, restoring roadless protections, listens to the voices of tribal nations and the people of southeast Alaska, while recognizing the importance of fishing and tourism to the region's economy. Conservation groups and Southeast Alaska tribal leaders applauded the change. Joel Jackson, president of the organized village of Cake, said in a statement, We are tied to our lands that our ancestors walked on thousands of years ago. We walk the same lands, and the land still provides food security, deer, moose, salmon, berries, our medicines. The old growth timber plays an important part in keeping all these things coming back year after year. It's our supermarket year around, and it is a spiritual place where we go to ground ourselves from time to time. Well, that brings us to our break, and when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world, and we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetRootsRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Emily Schwing. In September, a massive storm on Alaska's west coast brought a surge of water 17 miles inland from the Bering Sea to the Chupik village of Chivak. The the storm was crazy. What was crazy about it? 
Ah, uh, it it flooded down there. It was like a sea, but it was like a ocean. So, some powers turned out, and some people had to sleep at the school for three days. Just over 900 people live in this community. It sits on a high bank above the Ninglikfuk River. Elder John Pengayak says the storm shook his resolve. Uh, for three days, I was in turmoil because I finally realized how dangerous uh, our situation here in western Alaska is vulnerable from uh, very high winds and, and uh, water surge. The impact of the storm, called Murbach, is very real for thousands of rural residents in western Alaska. Dozens of villages saw some level of flooding. People lost power, causing chest freezers to defrost. The power outages destroyed months of subsistence food that people spent their summers storing up. Food security in this part of the state is precarious, and on top of defrosted freezers, Nearly all of the 90 or so boats people used to go fishing and hunting for their main sources of food in Chivak were damaged or destroyed. Pagayak says the losses are devastating. It's, yeah. it's our survival. Yeah. If I'm a Chupik, subsistence is mine. That's me. That's a subsistence is me. Because I'm the one that's going out and fishing. I'm the one that's going out and hunting for my family, and we do it for livelihood and survival. When it, the flood came in, it filled up with water, and then it drifted over and sunk right on the river channel. Clinton Slats was in Chivak's community hall days after the storm to report his losses to two employees who the village's tribal council had hired to take reports on the damage. He wasn't sure if he'd be able to retrieve his boat from the bottom of the Ninglikfak River. Hard to put into words how, it'll, how it impacts. It's just, I have no way to go hunt and gather with the remainder of the season that, by boat. The storm didn't just destroy boats and motors. Nearly a dozen fishing sheds that held all sorts of gear, from rifles to nets to gas cans and rain gear, were destroyed. Some had completely disappeared from the riverbank. Elsewhere across Alaska, summer fish camps and hunting cabins were destroyed. And because the storm arrived in Alaska before the ground was frozen, coastal erosion was extreme. And so, of course, it's much easier to uh, erode material that doesn't even have uh, any uh, ice in there to help stabilize it even a little as compared to uh, the same storm, say, now, uh, where, where things have started to freeze up. That's Rick Toman, a climate specialist at the Alaska Center for Climate Assessment and Policy at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. But the warming oceans contribute to that longer period of time before freeze-up gets going. And that, again, is something that is sure to continue into the future. He says conditions this year in the South Pacific were ripe for the development of a storm like Murbach. Historically, the, wa- the waters in that part of the subtropical um, Pacific are just not warm enough to support uh, typhoon development. But this year, the, the much of the subtropical Pacific east of Japan is far warmer than normal. Some areas the warmest on record. This storm was rare. Alaska hasn't seen anything like it in 50 years. Dozens of rural communities saw infrastructure damage in addition to flooding. Many scientists, including Tolman, believe the storm, which originated as a typhoon in the northwestern Pacific, is a harbinger of what climate change could bring to the northernmost U.S. state in coming years. Certainly we know um, a big contributor to the increased impacts isn't that there are more storms, but rather storms are coming when there's no sea ice. As the coldest months of winter bear down on Alaska, there's still currently no significant shorefast sea ice along Alaska's Bering Sea coast or further north along the shoreline of the southern Chukchi Sea, other than around the mouths of rivers. It's a phenomenon that's become the norm in recent years. In the 20th century, there would have been sea ice to offer protection or act as a, a buffer or a wave break. And with that gone, the impacts have increased.
After Murbach developed as a powerful typhoon, it made its way north and east toward Alaska. As it did so, it grew into something meteorologists really don't even have a word for. Some people called it the remnants of a typhoon. Toman referred to it as an ex-typhoon. But that kind of language doesn't do justice to describe its power or immensity. By the time it slammed into Alaska, it had tripled in size alone. Over the long term, there's not any good hard evidence that the intensity of these storms is increasing. But the background that they're working in, a, a warmer environment, a less frozen environment, is really, I think, the driver of the impacts. Residents in dozens of western Alaskan communities continue to repair damaged homes and outbuildings and to apply for disaster assistance through the Federal Emergency Management Agency, the state government, and other organizations. What Murbach laid bare is their vulnerability and the extreme need for improved and strengthened infrastructure as such storms become the new normal in the region. For 60 Second Science, I'm Emily Schwinn. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to NetrootsRadio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. It doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com page and hit our Secure Donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetrootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. Change the Pledge of Allegiance? I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. The original pledge, written by Socialist Minister Ralph Bellamy in 1892, was, I pledge allegiance to my flag and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. In the 1920s, the words, the flag of the United States of America, were substituted for my flag, a minor tinker. Then, in 1954, at President Eisenhower's urging, in order to combat godless communism, Congress inserted the words under God into the pledge. One nation under God, not a minor tinker. In the early 2000s, the majority of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that the words under God were unconstitutional, just as the words under Zeus or under no God or under Jesus would have been. However, in 2004, the Supreme Court preserved under God in the pledge by ruling that the father who had brought the case for his elementary school daughter lacked legal standing because the student's mother got sole legal custody in the divorce. The issue of under God in the pledge has not been back to the Supreme Court since. Alfred T. Goodwin, the federal judge who wrote the appeals court opinion that ruled the pledge unconstitutional, died last December 27th at the age of 99. Judge Goodwin will be remembered as a jurist who stood up for principle. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1907. That was the day that President Theodore Roosevelt signed into law an effort to get corporate money out of national politics. The law was called the Tillman Act. The act was named after its chief sponsor, Senator Benjamin Tillman of South Carolina. President Roosevelt had fallen under public criticism for taking corporate money in his 1904 run for office. After he won the race, he included the issue in his address to Congress. Teddy said... All contributions by corporations to any political committee for any political purpose should be forbidden by law. 
The resulting Tillman Act covered national banks and corporations, but the Act had no real enforcement provisions. Since the passage of the Tillman Act, Congress has moved to further regulate campaign financing more than 10 times. Labor union contributions were regulated for the first time during World War II. During the war, unions were strictly prohibited from direct political donations. During the 1944 election, for the first time, the CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organizations, set up a political action committee. The PAC was to support pro-labor candidates and legislation. Three years later, however, limits on union political spending were beefed up even further by the Taft-Hartley Act. The role of corporations and unions in campaign finance continues to be a hotly contested issue. In 2010, the United States Supreme Court decided the landmark case Citizens United. Their decision ruled that money equals speech. Corporations and unions can spend as much as they want on elections as long as they don't coordinate directly with individual campaigns. This has led to a flood of money by very wealthy donors into super PACs. More than a century after the passage of the Tillman Act, we still have not solved the question of election financing. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 31 degrees Fahrenheit. And we have an active air stagnation advisory, so everything is held close to the ground. Foggy conditions as well. Uh, and it looks like we're going to have partly cloudy skies later on with highs in the mid-50s, so they say. Winds light and variable. Partly cloudy overnight with lows in the mid-30s. Winds remaining light and variable and partly cloudy tomorrow with highs in the mid to upper 40s, winds light and variable. Pollen is still rated none here in the little village of Rogue River. The air quality index for the Rogue River Valley region is in the good range at 31 parts per million. And that daytime UV index is in the low range and has ticked down one notch to level one. Barometric pressure is holding steady at 30.63 inches. Visibility is a little more than a half mile. And relative humidity is at 95%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 44 degrees with light rain. Paris is 41 degrees and foggy. Rome is 55 degrees and fair. Kiev is 29 and mostly cloudy. Kabul is 16 degrees and clear. Hong Kong is 63 and partly cloudy. Tokyo is 37 and partly cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 72 degrees and mostly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 58 degrees sunny with a active beach advisory. Do not turn your back on the ocean. And New York, New York is 45 degrees Fahrenheit, cloudy and remaining under an active gale warning. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. at 
The Associated Press brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. Spain's labor ministry issued app-based food delivery company Golovo a new fine of $62 million U.S. for violating labor laws. The ministry said that Glovo was being punished for not con- contracting its writers as employees and for giving gigs to irregular immigrants without work permits. Last year, Glovo was smacked with a $86 million U.S. fine for similar infringements of labor laws. Labor Minister Yolanda Diaz said that recent legislation specifically targets companies that repeatedly break the law. No company, no matter how large it is, can act outside the law, Diaz said, and this is an exemplary case. In 2021, Diaz successfully championed a new writer's law that classified food delivery writers as employees of digital platforms they work for, as opposed to self-employed freelancers. Glovo is a Spanish company that operates in several countries, mostly in Europe. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mes autumns, quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Mike Corder of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A Jewish group that commissioned a survey on Holocaust awareness in the Netherlands said yesterday, Wednesday, that the results showed a disturbing lack of awareness of key historical facts about the Holocaust, prompting calls for better education in the nation that was home to diarist Anne Frank and her family. The survey, commissioned by the New York-based Conference on Jewish Material Claims Against Germany, found that the number of respondents who believe the Holocaust is a myth was higher than in any of the other five nations previously surveyed. In the survey, 23% of adults under age 40 and 12% of all respondents indicated they believe the Holocaust was a myth or that the number of Jews killed has been greatly exaggerated. Not only is this downright shocking, it is very serious. Dutch Justice Minister Dilan Zergeres said, Almost a quarter of the Dutch people born after 1980 think that the Holocaust is a myth, or that it is heavily exaggerated. As a society, we have a lot of work to do, and fast, too. The survey also found that 54% of all respondents and 59% of those under age 40 do not know that 6 million Jews were murdered. Some 29% believe that figure is 2 million or fewer. fewer. Of the 140,000 Jews who lived in the Netherlands before World War II, 102,000 were killed during the Holocaust. Another 2,000 Jewish refugees in the country also were killed in the genocide. Despite that grim history, 53% of those surveyed do not cite the Netherlands as a country where the Holocaust took place. Only 22% of all respondents were able to identify Westerbork, 
a transit camp in the eastern Netherlands where Jews, including Anne Frank, were sent before being deported. The camp is now a museum and commemoration site. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day, but you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here tomorrow for Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks, and we will meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver